Hello and welcome to the Stansberry Investor Hour. I'm your host, Dan Ferris. I'm also the editor of Extreme Value, published by Stansberry Research. Today we'll talk with Joel Littman. He's the chief investment strategist at Altimetry. He has a completely different view on things. I think you'll love it. In the mailbag today, Lots of great stuff. Options, investment planning, gold, and the U.S. dollar. A great question on the U.S. dollar. And remember, you can call our listener feedback line, 800-381-2357. Tell us what's on your mind and hear your voice on the show. For my opening rant this week, well, it looks like the headlines are starting to catch up with me. That and more right now on the Stansberry Investor Hour. The headlines are catching up with Dan. Dan's been bearish and bearish and bearish. And even though the market's been down, people have been talking about the Fed pivoting so that they will be cutting rates instead of raising it. And where's the bottom and all this stuff. And now it's a little different. Now, on the front page of the Bloomberg website this morning, it says Bank of America sees new lows for U.S. stocks as inflation shock ain't over. And then there's another little headline says, U.S. dollar only place to hide in 2022 as risk assets sink, Citi says, Citibank. So, yeah, other folks are starting to catch on. And there's another, of course, you probably heard about FedEx. And a Barron's headline says, FedEx has a message on the economy. Wall Street hates it. I think the stock actually had its worst day on Friday. Uh, it was down 24%. And they changed their guidance. Actually, they they just withdrew their full year financial guidance. They really disappointed everyone. And management said, you know, global volume softness was a problem. Like globally, their 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 business is global. It's kind of an economic bellwether on the global economy. And and the volumes were soft and they Barron's kind of piggybacked on that and said the economy is slowing, costs are a problem, they're closing 90 locations, they're slow to hire. I mean, it's a whole bunch of stuff. And the stock just got murdered. This big cap bellwether company down 24% in one day. Reminds me of what happened to Facebook a couple years back. And like about a year before that, I had warned people, this can happen to big cap like blue chip, and I'm doing air quotes here, blue chip stocks, they can get absolutely obliterated in a single day. And and folks forget that. One of the things that a, a relentless bull market or you know a really huge speculative mania like we've seen since the COVID bottom, one of the things that gets beat out of you is the idea that Stocks can just get creamed in a single day like that with a big blue chip down 24%. People figure, oh, well, this is safe. I mean, and there's there's actually an article in the Wall Street Journal says investors are pouring into U.S. stocks to avoid greater turbulence overseas. So everything else is even worse than the U.S., but, you know, it ain't great in the U.S. Like, if you think this is the safe haven, I don't know. I hope you're right, actually. Because if not, um, we're in for a lot more pain. And I think I hate to I hate to agree with Bank of America, but I think they're right. I, I don't think the inflation shock is over, and I think that's been a consistent problem. I've said this before; I'll say it again. Inflation is a stickier phenomenon than that, and inflation it hits people for longer and harder, and it takes longer to wend its way through the economy right? It starts, in this case, it started when government, you know, especially the US government basically borrowed. And when I say borrowed, you should hear the word printed trillions of dollars to try to sort of get out of the post COVID funk, right? And that caused the price of a lot of stuff to go up because in addition to printing the money, there were also shortages, things were locked down. So we had less of of certain goods and services. So all that new money coming into the system pushes up the prices of the existing ones. And it, you know, it gives us what we've seen, 8%, 9% CPI inflation. And, And that hits people in the pocketbook and people change their plans. Businesses change their plans. I've said this before. 
inflation is bad for everyone. Anytime somebody tells me, hey, inflation is good for this business, it's good for gold stocks, it's good for whatever, I disagree. You know, it it may cause the price of, you know, gold or something to go up, which it hasn't really done much this time around, but it's not good for anybody's business. It makes everybody's costs go up, right? So it's not a good thing. And now finally, like the headlines are starting to reflect where, where I've been for over a year. And normally that would cause me to go, okay, okay, it's over, right? <laughs> Everybody's bearish now, so it's over. I don't think that's true. In the short term, if we get some kind of a bounce or a bear market rally or something, yeah, I, that would surprise no one because bear markets are notorious for sucking bears in and then rallying and sucking bulls in and falling. I mean, it's a, it's bad. It tends to be bad for bulls and bears alike because it's just such a volatile time and it's difficult to it's difficult to trade. I did this. I showed this in an issue of Extreme Value some years ago, and I used the example of Apple during the dot com bust, uh, during the run up. You know, the dot com boom say from, I think it was like 98 to the top in 2000 and then down. And yeah, there were huge moves, but man, you couldn't, it would have been nearly impossible for the overwhelming majority of people to trade them because right as soon as you get the momentum signal, it reverses direction. And of course, that's, that's sort of what's been happening here in this bear market. They're all like that. They're all brutal. It's really tough. And I think just the fact that everybody's bearish right now, will we see another rally? You know, I think stocks have been down. I just saw four out of five weeks or something like that. You know, sure, sure. There will be more rallies. And if I'm right, um, they will be bigger rallies as the market goes lower because as the market goes lower, people become more bearish. They become more hesitant. So it takes a bigger rally to kind of suck them back in. And it sounds perverse, but that's the model. That's the mental model that I would use. The market is sadistic and it will act, especially in a bear market, is it sadistic? And it will act in such a way as to harm the greatest number of, of people. So I think the, you know, one of the only, there's no way to avoid it really, unless you're just completely out of the market altogether. And I never advise that because as bearish as I may be, and as often as I may refer to historical examples, I don't know the future, and neither do you, and neither does anyone. Nobody knows how things are going to be for you know the next 10 years. I can't tell you whether the stock market's going to be up or down, whether it's going to be up or down 10 years from now. Historically speaking, when things have you know reached this point, we have a difficult several years, and it takes several years for the market to make a new high, but hey, that's I've talked about this before too. It's high. It's a high water effect, right? Just because it happened in the past, you know the the lows and highs of the past are no meaningful limit to the lows and highs of the future, right? It's just like a like a high water mark in a town where there's been some flooding. Just because you know you look at the high water mark halfway up some building, I promise you it can be higher, right? The lows can be lower. The highs can be higher. And since humanity is going to keep getting out of bed every day and going to work, you know, the highs will eventually, you know, become all time highs. And we will make new highs. The market will rise again, whether it does it in the next six months and makes a new high or in the next six years. That's a bigger question. And the reason why I'm kind of bearish and cautious and trying to help people out right now with this, because. I think it can destroy you. These times can destroy you as an investor. You know, most of the time the market kind of goes up, there's little corrections, you don't have to worry about it. But then then there's times like this where we could be at the beginning of an absolutely brutal bear market. Historically speaking, I think there's enough evidence to suggest um, some likelihood of being at the beginning of a brutal bear episode here. And people behave really really badly. They just do. They sell all. They they sell out at the bottom, basically. 
That's the one thing that I don't want everyone to do. So like when you're, when the market draws down sharply like this, you don't hear me telling people to sell their stocks. You know, I, I remind them what I've always said, which is keep a truly diversified portfolio and prepare for a wider than usual range of outcomes. Usually the range of outcomes is when's the market going to make a new high, right? That, there's no, that's a narrow range of outcomes. But a wide range is, you know, do we go on to make new highs within the next year or do we go on to make new lows? Whoa, you know, new lows from here, that could be brutal. New highs, wow. I don't think anybody's expecting that right now. So, so prepare yourself, have plenty of cash. And generally speaking, plenty means, you know, 20 to maybe 50% of, of your equity portfolio, an amount equal to that. And you got to decide, you know, you better than I do. So you decide what's right for you. But, you know, if we get lower equity prices, you don't want to be without plenty of cash. And if we get higher ones, you don't want to have sold all your stocks, right? And I still think you should own some gold and silver. I'll answer um, a question about gold and silver in the mailbag today, but I still think that you should own some gold and silver. I think it's been around for 5,000 years, and I think it's going to be around for a few thousand more. And if you're, if you're you know, worried about it because the short-term performance is not what people would have expected with, with inflation numbers being what they are. I think you should be less worried about that. I think you should be more worried about, am I adequately diversified? And that includes holding gold and silver. I'm going to keep it short and sweet today, okay? Things are getting serious. Lots of other people are getting bearish. It's hitting the headlines now. And I still think there's more downside. Will we get a big ratcheting rally to, you know, make me look like an idiot again or whatever? Almost guaranteed, right? Almost guaranteed. But I I still believe that the historical examples of the mega bubbles of 1929 um, and the bear market from 1929 to 1932 and the bear market from 2000 to 2002 and also the Japan mega bubble bear market from 1989 to 2012. You know, these are like minus, roughly speaking, minus 75 to almost 90%, right, events. So if we're in something like that, man, do we have a long way to go. Be, you know, just take your time, all right? I'm going to leave you right there because I really want to get to this interview. I want you to hear, I'm, I'm dying for you to hear what our guest has to say today. He's brilliant. He sees things a completely different way and has a completely different sort of a method that he's going to tell you about today. His name is Joel Littman. Let's talk to him. Let's do it right now. Please pay close attention right now. The next 30 seconds could make up for all your stock market losses this year and even maybe save your retirement. On September 22nd, you'll have a rare chance to hear from two Wall Street legends, Mark Chaikin and Joel Littman. Mark spent 50 years on Wall Street where he worked alongside the likes of Paul Tudor Jones and invented one of Wall Street's most popular indicators, a stock picking system that appears on every Bloomberg terminal in the world today. His biggest fans include CNBC's Jim Cramer, who said he's learned the hard way never to bet against Mark. Meanwhile, Joel Littman is a forensic accountant who spent the last 30 years denouncing Wall Street. He predicted the crash of 2008 months before it hit, and his insights are in such high demand, he's been invited to speak at Harvard, the FBI, and even the Pentagon. What Mark and Joel are going to share with you on September 22nd could make or break your retirement, a way to make five times your money, even if the market crashes another 20% this year. And they say what's coming before the end of the year will create and destroy fortunes, depending on which side you're on. Let's face it, the stock market's been a minefield this year with the biggest sell-off we've seen in 50 years. And thanks to inflation, even cash isn't really safe anymore. Your money is losing value even as we speak at a rate we haven't seen since the 1980s. If you want to survive this disorienting market, then don't miss Mark and Joel's big reveal on September 22nd. On that day, 
they'll be giving you a financial lifeline that could erase this year's losses for you and trigger a wave of potential wealth. It's so powerful, it could save your retirement. And you don't have to wait until September 22nd to get started for a sneak peek of Mark and Joel's big reveal. Just go to september22warning.com. That's september22warning.com. It is time once again for our interview, and today's guest is Joel Littman. Joel Littman is the chief investment strategist at Altimetry. As Altimetry's chief investment strategist, Professor Joel Littman, professor, mind you, advises individual investors in equities, corporate credit, and macroeconomic strategy. He is also the president and CEO of Valens Research. Joel has taught or guest lectured at Harvard Business School, the University of Chicago Booth, the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania, London Business School, Shanghai Advanced Institute of Finance, and others. As if that's not enough, others. Additionally, he helped build Credit Suisse's Holt University and Dry House, I hope I'm saying that right, College of Commerce at DePaul University Center for Strategy, Execution and Valuation, MBA Concentration. And with that, Joel, welcome to the show. Thank you, Dan. How are you doing, man? Good. It's good to be here again. Yeah, it's been a while. And because it's been a while, actually, I wonder if we could just do sort of a classic first question that I sometimes like to do. Uh, and if you and I you know, had met in a bar and finance came up and I said, oh, what kind of investor are you? What would you tell our listeners? Well, I'm definitely of the Ben Graham, Buffett, Klarman, Mitch Julis you know, uh, value investor ilk. But you mentioned uh, that uh, I helped build this program at the Driehaus College of Commerce. And Richard Driehaus <clears throat> was probably the greatest for the last 40, 50 years. He passed away recently. It's very sad. Um, but probably the greatest growth and in mo investor mm. ever. And, and I did some work with him also. So I would, I'd say uh, I'm, you know, I'm research. So I'm whatever my clients need. But my clients, if you know, if I if I were to launch a fund, it'd definitely be value investing fund. But that said, I have clients that sometimes say they want growth stocks, they want momentum stocks, they want things that are a bit more trade oriented. And when that happens, uh, I'll uh, I'll adjust our research, I'll I'll tune our research in to what our clients are. Okay, um, maybe tell us a little bit about uh, your firm Altimetry, right? So you kind of transferred from institutions basically to launching this this separate firm altimetry how did that come about well you know it, helping the really rich of the world get richer is a nice lucrative business and it certainly pays the bills um but i remember someone told me years ago they said you know you could still do well by helping individuals and families because if you get a lot of clients paying you a small amount of money you know they can add up to be as much as a small amount of clients relatively speaking who pay you you know, big sums of money. And so we launched Altimetry in partnership with Stansbury, and it's been fantastic. We're reaching all kinds of people that I didn't reach before. Um, it was a big switch. Probably when I was on your show, Dan, about three years ago, mm -hmm. was just about the time when we made that, I'll say switch. We're still servicing institutions. I mean, 230 of the biggest 300 money managers in the world are reading our work, and I can name who. I can, I can name what they're reading, but uh, it's been wonderful to, to open up this branch for individuals and families um, because we get different questions. We get different requests. And some of our best stock ideas are micro cap ideas or small cap ideas, which the big institutions are too big to invest in. But a lot of our individual and family investors, it's just the right size. And so uh, it, it's opened up some new markets for us also, not just in customers, but new parts of the stock market that we can focus our research on. Um, that is a very different kind of research than anything you see on Wall Street or, or elsewhere. So very different from Wall Street, but for individuals, that's cool. Yes, sir. Yeah, it's um, individuals and families. And you know the, the newsletter business, which is the easiest way, newsletter plus database online that people can access and punch in their own companies and, and see how their own portfolios do. It's it's a nice business. Yeah, that's it's different than the institutional work. You know, Very cool. I love that whole punch in the ticker and get me a whole bunch of information thing. People love that. So- you are one of the uh, few people who can really say that they called the 2008, you know, stock market drop and the 2020. So, of course, given recent events, everybody listening to this is like dying for you to say, well, you know, what does the system say now, Joel? <laughs> What's next? Of course. So, Dan, um, 
look, I, I know I'm pretty sure that we're in disagreement, maybe not violent disagreement, disagreement on this, but that's because I am with a lot of other uh, strategists. But in 2008, what I, pres- I was at a CFA presentation in New York City. Um, there's a good chunk of big institutional investors in the room. Um, no families, no individuals. At the time, we were just purely an institutional research shop in terms of clients. And uh, we were showing what was happening to corporate credit. Jesse Livermore knew this. Uh, Buffett um, and the greatest investors know this. Um, ben Graham mentions the word debt or credit more than two, three hundred times in intelligent investor and security analysis, right? So going back to the Ben Graham was the professor and teacher of literally the greatest group of investors that have ever lived from Buffett to Munger to Klarman to Tweedy Brown to um, Shelby Davis um, and the Davis funds. When you look at that lineage, you find that understanding corporate credit is absolutely the canary in the coal mine. Corporate credit and national you know, country credit is the canary in the coal mine of any major bear market equity bear market in pretty much history, in history. And so in 2008, one of our, our big calls was we were showing that the stock market had fallen around 12, 13%. This is early 2008, first half of 2008. Stock market had fallen 12, 13%. Not bad. And people are saying, oh, it's just a correction, whatever. And we showed corporate credit signals that were scary. They were scarier than than what you might have seen in like in 1929, 1930, 1931. Really scary numbers. Mm-hmm. And we said, it's not going to get better anytime soon. This is going to be a disaster. And that's what the signals were saying. Um, you mentioned 2020. I, I don't think, you know, when we said the market looked toppy in February of 2020, we weren't predicting that the pandemic was going to create that massive crash. Mm-hmm. But we did think that the market looked expensive and what have you for all kinds of reasons. Um, but corporate credit wasn't one of them. It wasn't. And at the bottom of the crash in April of 2020, I think what I'd, I'd rather be known for, um, and it's very public, you can Google it. Um, in March, we called a long on the stock market, March of 2020. Mm-hmm. Um, we reiterated in April of 2020. Um, I did some talk shows, uh, as did uh, my partner, our director of research, Rob Spivey, in our business. Uh, so April, May, June, we reiterated over and over and over again um, how the stock market was in a K-shaped recovery. There are certain stocks um, that were going to do very, very well, but overall the S&P was going to recover, right? Was going to recover. Mm-hmm. And the reason that we had such conviction then to set up to what's happening now is corporate credit was unbelievably strong. And frankly, we didn't see any issues with national debt either. And that is the situation right now, Dan. Okay. Right now, U.S. corporate credit is unbelievably healthy. I mean, you see people online saying, but there's more corporate debt outstanding you know, than ever before, even more than 2008. And we're like, yeah, but the coverage ratios, the corporate earnings and cash flows able to service that debt is even higher than it's ever been by like a lot more. So even though debt may be you know, percentages higher than it was in 2008, corporate debt, corporate debt across the board for all you know, uh, publicly listed companies. Mm-hmm. You find that um, the cash flow ready to cover that debt service and the cash on the books, by the way, is multiples bigger than it used to be. Multiples. And so any basic credit research looking at these companies would say, you know, these companies are not at risk of uh, default. We don't have massive bankruptcies on the horizon, which always a company all the way back to 1929 or 1907 or in the 1800s, you always see corporate credit crises at the beginning of any massive long-term bear market. So the 20% correction that we've seen, right? Yes, technically, technically it's a bear market is 20%. But being 20% down after the market has risen 75% from the bottoms of March and April 2020 is not the same thing as a market that's kind of sideways and then has fallen 20%, right? Yes, it's giving up gains, but those gains were made in the last 12 months, not you know, like you're losing gains that you've been making for the last three years or something. So no, we're not in the beginning of some massive equity bear market. The corporate credit would tell us that. And by the way, country debt also is not at risk. People keep saying the US is too much debt outstanding. It's just ridiculous to say that. Um, It could get bad, but it isn't right now by any stretch of the imagination. And so you put those credit things together, healthy credit, healthy credit environment, and no, we're not at the beginning of some giant equity bear market. It's a correction in an otherwise still strong bull market that started in March, April, May of 2020. Okay. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, we, we've heard every different kind of view on the show. So, it, you know, we interview all kinds of different people with all kinds of different views. And like, really, nobody is in total agreement with me. I mean, maybe one or two out of, you know, a hundred or something. But, um, yeah, you know, anyway, so. Well, I like your views. And I, and you've got, a, Dan, you've got a long history of the markets. So, you know, you, you always want to seek any educated opinion to be able to look at it. Um, the difference for us is just we've got data that the rest of the world doesn't have. Right. We spent 20 plus years building this database um, that includes 32,000 companies. We do our own credit research. We don't rely on S&P Moody's and Fitch because I don't trust those firms. Um, we don't rely on Wall Street earnings, uh, earnings numbers because I don't trust any Wall Street analysts, particularly not their buy-sell opinion. Um, and because we're doing that in-house on such a massive scale, we put it together and we just have a different perspective because we've got data that's different than every other firm has. Because it's not just me and, and our director of research and what have you. It's, it's 150 people in this firm um, at Altimetry. So you have, you have data that other people don't have or do you have the same data that you're looking at differently? So one, we get raw financial statement data from companies as they file it. And then what we found... We have raw financial statement data from companies, right, 32,000 plus companies around the world. What we found is even the database providers get the data wrong. So we've picked the best database providers of these 32,000 companies globally, right, more than five, 6,000 companies in the U.S. alone. And then we fix the raw data. We actually have algorithms that tell us, all right, there's something wrong. Reuters or Bloomberg or FactSet or S&P has picked up bad data from the 10K or the 10Q. Mm -hmm. So we fix that data. Uh, that's I'm going to tell you right now, that's more than a couple thousand fixes every month. So think of that cumulatively over years. Yeah. And you have a different raw financial statement data set than the planet has. Yep. Then <clears throat> we take that and we change the accounting to get to uniform accounting. We don't allow companies to make electives where... One is on the LIFO method of accounting of inventory, and one is on FIFO. How can you have two companies with two different accounting and then compare their earnings numbers when their earnings is being calculated differently? So we do that across the world. Chinese accounting standards, by the way, don't follow exactly international accounting standards, so we have to adjust China. U.S. GAAP allows for way too many electives between companies. So one company will be using fair value accounting, another one will be using historic accounting, and they're in the same industry and they're peers, right? Or one company will be capitalizing leases. FedEx and UPS, totally incomparable financial statements. Even the cash flow statements of FedEx and UPS, totally incomparable. So we clean up the data and we get a far better, cleaner data set than any other research firm that we're aware of, right? I, I mean, I know some buy side firms that are doing very similar things to what we're doing. BlackRock is one of them. But BlackRock doesn't share their data with anybody right. and they don't use it to, to teach. They say, we're going to use it for ourselves. So we're doing this with the data and then we do this uniform accounting. So we get one set of accounting rules through history so that if we're looking at companies in the 1960s or 1970s or 80s, we get a clear understanding that that earnings has been calculated the same way as the earnings today. So we understand market cycles at a different level. And then we put all that together. We apply it to credit also, not just to equities. And when you do all that, you end up with different signals than you hear from Wall Street, totally different credit analysis and analytics than you hear from Moody's S&P or Fitch. And it gives us both individual stock ideas and, and macro signals that we don't see anybody else have. So it's, it took us a long time to build, but it, it definitely is a, a, a secret weapon, if you will, although not so secret um, because we tell everyone how we built it. Mm -hmm. uh, it just it takes a long time to try to do what we did. That's really cool. And I didn't realize it was like for the entire world, not just the U.S. market. So you have, I'm told that you have some really interesting contacts in places like, you know, the FBI and the Pentagon and various other places in the government. So, you know, speaking of the whole rest of the world, what, uh, you know, what does the rest of the world look like? Like, what are these contacts of yours telling you about you know, China, Russia, Europe, there's a lot going on in the world right now. Um, yeah, I, I am, Dan, uh, an advisor to the Pentagon. I taught at MC War, the U.S. Marine Corps War College. And when I taught there several years ago, they literally said to me, they said, you realize that the people in this room um, go on to become Joint Chiefs of Staff. It's that it's that sample of mm. personnel from the military that are in your class classes. And I said, wow, I didn't know. I mean, I, you know, I get invited to teach at universities all the time. 
And then that happened. So a year later, uh, one of my students said, by the way, I'm stationed, my new duty is at the Pentagon. And I think people at the Pentagon need to hear what you're saying about what's happening in economics and the global balance of economic power. And I said, I'm happy to. And the reason um, he brought me in, and so now I can, I'm allowed to say that I'm an advisor uh, to the Pentagon, in the Pentagon, the Department of Defense, and I'm allowed to say this, uh, that um, when you add up and do aggregate credit and equity work across the world with a clean data set, you start to find really interesting things that is not being reported by the mainstream media because the media is using bad data. And in many cases, I think the media just, they come up with a narrative and then they go and find the data to support it. It's the opposite of the scientific method, <laughs> yeah, right. right? It's, hey, I have an opinion and I'm going to go prove it's right. Well, this is what the media does. And, you know, we were in that same camp of saying, oh, it must be that they're correct until we started testing these things. So we took our data set and we looked at US, we looked at China and we looked at at a government level also, I think that's uh, important to mention, that we looked at a government level also at the accounting, mm -hmm. at the government accounting also, and you get a totally different view of the planet. Um, one is uh, that the United States, Pax Americana, if you want to call it, there have been four Paxes, then, right? Pax Romana, the Roman Empire, where you have one super economic power mm -hmm. uh, on the planet that, that really... Uh, guides and shapes things. Mm -hmm. Then you had Pax Mongolica with the Khanate, you know, Kublai Khan and Genghis Khan mm -hmm. that stretched all the way into Europe. Then you had Pax Ottomanica based in Turkey, um, the Ottoman Empire. Then Pax Britannica. Well, now we're in Pax Americana. And people are saying that Pax Americana died out 20 years ago, 30 years ago when US GDP as a share of the world's GDP really started falling and started saying we're entering, you know, Pax China where China is going to be the dominant economic power. Dan, nothing could be further from the truth. It is silly talk. And when you find the magazines and the, and the media pulling up data, you literally find that they're finding data to, to support their opinion. Because when you look at the economic earnings at a corporate country level, corporate America versus corporate China versus corporate um, Europe or, or any, any country, which we have, you find that U.S. economic earnings is greater than the rest of the entire planet combined. So to call China number two may be accurate in literal terms, but is a gross, gross over-exaggeration of the power of that country, given that China plus all other countries in the world, Germany, France, UK, you name it, throw them all in there, and you still get an economic earnings total profitability, which is, isn't even a third of what the United States is. Not even a third. And when you add that up, you say, wait a second. Well, when a country has money to spend, where does a country get its money? Most countries, their money comes from three places. Corporate earnings, taxing corporate earnings, household income, taxing people's salaries and wages, and third, VAT, or you know, sales tax or value-added tax. Right? Well, when you look around the world, the U.S. now collects more in taxes, and just to make this clear, on a lower tax rate than other countries charge, lower tax rate, the U.S. collects more in absolute taxes than any other country by a long shot, by more than double or even triple any other country. Number two is China. Number two is China. But China's tax receipts have been falling, flattening and then falling. And don't blame the pandemic for that. They, they're saying it's a pandemic. No, that China has had a economic issue, a corporate credit crisis that started five, six, seven years ago, um, which you won't get because Moody's, s and and Fitch don't cover enough companies in China to be able to show that, but we can show it. And, uh, and in the United States, we have corporate tax receipts that have been skyrocketing on a lower tax rate level. Why? Because earnings and personal earnings and everything else the government collects on lower tax rates or even higher. Where does the government get its power, its economic power? It comes from taxation. We're looking at a situation that five to seven years from now, the U.S. federal government will collect more in taxes than the entire rest of the planet combined. Now, think about this if you're at the Pentagon. That means the U.S. will have more money for the defense budget than the entire rest of the world combined. Mm. The U.S. will have more money for social services. Then the entire rest of the world combined. The U.S. have more money for FDI. Everyone's talking about China's Belt and Road, and they're investing outside in other countries, and they're taking over airports, and it's like nothing compared 
to what the U.S. has the capability of doing should it choose, meaning to invest and fund and provide loans and equity uh, and loans and whatever to other countries. Not even close because the U.S. budget will be bigger than the rest of the entire planet combined. And it's going to stay that way for a few decades. The idea that this is going to go the other direction is just crazy talk. It comes from people who don't understand accounting because, Dan, you know this and, and maybe your listeners remember. I'm an accountant. I'm a CPA. Right? This is how I started out. And we see different numbers because we dive into the accounting, both corporate and government accounting at a different level. And that gives us numbers that you know people say, well, we should just be looking at this number. We're like, sorry, that's the wrong number. You're looking at the wrong number. If you look at the right numbers and you really understand government and corporate accounting, you get an understanding of Pax Americana is in full swing. And the US will be the super dominant economic power for the next, I don't know, decades? Decades. Um, which, by the way, Dan, makes the United States stock market the best place to invest because U.S. companies have the highest earnings. At the end of the day, why do you buy, as Ben Graham and Buffett would say, and Seth Klarman, why do you buy stocks? Because they have the highest earning power. Well, if you want to find the companies with the highest earning power, they're all going to be U.S. domiciled. They already are by far. And it's growing, not shrinking the way the mainstream media would tell you. You know, I wouldn't argue with any of that. The only thing I would push back on is that you could say the same thing about all the PACs right at the top. You know, right when they were at the top, everybody said, it'll be this way forever. It's better than it's ever been. And it'll be this way forever. So, but you know, that being the case, you know, is it going to be another 50 or a hundred years? I mean, that would be a drop in the bucket historically. Right. So. And Dan, your point's right. Is that, is that people say, well, maybe it's, it's because it's at the high, that's the reason a top ticket. And I'd say, yes. So that's why we have to look at signals. Because on a company's way up, a company, right, a stock's way up, mm -hmm. it always looks like it's hitting a new high. The U.S. stock market, whenever it hits a new high, everyone says, oh, well, this is a new high. And like, yeah, but then a week later, it's another new high. And so you need the signals to tell you if we're at that point of, okay, it's rolling over. And in, in talk about Roman Empire and other empires, you could see it when you started seeing massive fiat currency, currency devaluation, which is not what you're saying in the United States. Right. And this is another big controversial thing that people get all crazy about. Mm -hmm. The US dollar, there is zero chance, zero Dan, that the US dollar will not be the reserve currency of the world again for the next decades. Right. The idea that the the currency of the US, like the Roman Empire, people often say, when you started seeing them, you know, quote unquote, right, printing coins and there's less metal in the coins and all the things that was leading to the Roman downfall over a few hundred years, that is not what you're seeing right now in the United States. Um, certainly not right right now with rising interest rates and a dollar that's getting stronger, not weaker. It's just, it, yeah. it, of course, everything is saying this will continue. Right. Of course, the dollar is not, it's not that it's getting stronger. It's that the other currencies are weakening more, right? If you look at a chart of the yen uh, and if the that's euro, true. So, Dan, then why <laughs> gold was down 5% last year, silver was down 11% against the dollar last year, palladium was down 22%, right? Yep. Because this is, I mean, the idea that money printing did, I'm like, so if it didn't do it in 2021, it's doing it in 2022, right? Well, then why aren't all these metals like skyrocketing like they would have in the 1970s, like they did in 1930s or in other periods of time where you had true currency devaluation, right? So right. yes, the dollar is getting stronger relative to the currencies and relative to metals. I'm not saying that the gold is going to collapse. I'm not, I'm not like an anti-gold bug. I'm just saying... If this were the case, why aren't we seeing a gigantic, why isn't gold at its best days, right? Why isn't palladium, right, at its best days? Right. No, that's a, that's a great argument. And, you know, we could go back and forth a million times with this stuff. But Yes, I love it. Dan, yeah. that's why I love, I love talking with you. Yeah. Not just here, but when you know, we run into yeah. each other, right? Uh, it's, it's great discussions. All right. So beyond that, though, um, I keep hearing about these, like, quote, unquote, perfect stocks that you have. and if I know anything about our listener, like they would much rather hear about that than hear, you know, Dan push back on why everything is so wonderful. <laughs> so I, I think we should probably get to that there. I promise you, like they tolerate my bearish view, but they want stock ideas and they want them like pronto yesterday and, and they want to know how to find them, too. So, yeah, the the you know, the perfect stock is it's kind of like the holy grail, mm -hmm. right? Um, it's it's the search for it. You know, it's the journey um, getting it. Are we ever going to get to the perfect stock? You know, who knows? Who knows? But are we on our way there? Well, on our way means we're producing alpha. So all of our newsletters, 
hidden alpha, high alpha. We're alpha focused, right? That is what the greatest investors in the world are focused on, meaning you have to beat the S&P. Um, you have to beat the market. If the market's up 29% in 2021 and you're up 29% on your stock picks, you've done nothing, right? Mm -hmm. Literally. And you took on idiosyncratic risk on those individual names. So what would define a perfect stock is if you have a, a better track record at beating the market. And uh, I'm happy to say, you know, since we launched um, Hidden Alpha, High Alpha and our microcap confidential with Stansbury, all of our newsletters are beating the market by large margins. All the stock picks from literal buy date to the sell date, which we provide exact dates and times of when to buy and when to sell. And we're beating the market handily. Um, large caps, we do well um, in beating the market, but our, our small cap and our micro caps, where you really find some gems that Wall Street doesn't even look at because they only cover you know large companies that do banking transactions. Um, one of the problems with Wall Street is their research coverage is tiny. We're covering 32,000 companies. I think if you added all Wall Street bulge bracket firms together, together, you might find 6,000 companies globally covered. Right, right, yeah. Not even close. So um, the idea was that we started working together with Mark Chaikin. And Chaikin, you know, has been more or less on Wall Street for the last 20 plus years, um, more than that, probably 30 plus years. Well, for the last 20 years, I've been attacking Wall Street and saying, what's wrong with it? What's wrong with equity research? What's wrong with credit research? What's wrong with... Um, and if you look at the headlines, uh, I think in 2004... I published a Harvard Business Review article called uh, Give My Regrets to Wall Street, um, which was my first big salvo saying, uh, there's something really wrong with what's going on here. And HBR was kind enough to publish it. It was a fun case study. And since then, my headlines are always, you know, what's wrong with Goldman? Goldman got this wrong. You know, look at the other banks doing this wrong. So here is this uh, unexpected combination of Chaikin, who's been on Wall Street, um, and he has this timing indicator, short term, not a Ben Graham follower, um, uses gap accounting in some of his calculations, just straight up gap accounting from published databases. So, and he admits it, he goes, look, I'm not, I don't have the time and effort to clean up the data or whatever, but his focus is on short term movements, short term timing, and he does very well. Um, and he makes some really good shorter term calls. So we took his database and his data set. And we took our database and data set and we back tested over the last 10, 15 years since the inception of his data set and ours. And we said, what if you combined our signals? What if you combined our signals and only used his best positive signals with our conviction long idea signals? And what if we combine them? And if it didn't show up in both lists, we kill it. Now, my big concern was we we're going to find zero stocks. That what he was doing on a short-term basis was totally different from our longer-term fundamental Ben Graham Buffett kind of style of investing, and that they wouldn't match. What we found was crazy. We found 133 stocks, 133 stocks, about 10 per year, about 10 per year for the years we studied, that lined up on both of our systems. And those stocks beat either of our track records, either ours or his. That somehow, think about our good fundamental ideas, his timing would get our buy recommendations either in sooner or get us out of a stock a little bit earlier or have us stay in a stock a little bit later than our fundamentals would have said. And so we still relied on our fundamentals. We weren't going out and buying stocks that didn't make sense from an economic earnings, uniform earnings standpoint. Um, we didn't rely on his gap numbers. We said, let's look at everything you're doing, what we're doing, and let's see where they match. And it was about 10 a year, 10 a year. And you found more of these perfect stocks, quote unquote, perfect because you're matching timing and fundamentals, right? His timing with our fundamentals. When you match them uh, together, we found more of these ideas in periods like today, meaning when you have a market down and volatility and people are wondering which way to go, you find a lot more of these ideas popped up than in a you know, 20, you know, 14 or 2015 where the market kind of just rose. So when you put those together, we found something interesting. And so we're now launching a product together, Chaikin and Altimetry, his power gauge with all our Altimeter. And we've been building these databases for years, so we have not fused the databases together. That would take us a long time. But what we're doing is putting our research teams together 
and saying, what's coming out of your set? What's coming out of our set? And whenever we see these signals line up, let's tell our clients and let's produce a newsletter specifically for that. And that's led to this idea of the perfect stock. And, uh, you know, I don't know that there ever will be a perfect stock, but it's pretty interesting. It's really interesting. Well, the idea of you and Chaikin getting together, that is, uh, to me, like, I know both of you. So I'm like, whoa, look the hell out. <laughs> you know, um, it sounds like a lot of, yeah. <laughs> we get along well. It, we actually really do. Uh, and this is not, I'm not just saying this for the viewers. Like, he, he has a different style. You know, he's, if you, if the, if your listeners remember him, he's, he's, you know, more quiet and more stoic and more, you know, here's what's happening. And you have me, and you know I get a little bit excited, you know, when we get in these things. But somehow we're a really good match. Yeah. We fit together. So uh, it's been fun doing the research together. It's been fun getting our teams working together, and the results uh, I think are going to be fantastic. And that's why we're we're launching. We have a webinar we're doing uh, this. Is it this Thursday, September twenty two? This Thursday night, eight p.m. Uh, and I'm really excited for it. It'll be it'll be a really fun show. Whenever we get together, we have a, a really good back and forth. So I'm yeah, and just real quick, um, you can go sign up for the webinar at a website called September22warning.com. So the word warning, I don't normally associate that with you, Joel. I'm like, warning? What is he warning me about? I'm going to make too much money in the next couple of years? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's we are still in the middle of the biggest mass deception in financial history, which is called GAP mm. and IFRS accounting. And as a CPA, you know, this is me slamming my own profession, but the fact is the fact, right? The accounting, people are looking at earnings and they're going to say, are we in a bear market? Are we in a bull market? And then they use, you know, the CAPE model, right? Mm -hmm. The Schiller uh, cyclically adjusted mm -hmm. price to earnings multiple. And that multiple has been signaling a bear market for the last six, seven years. I think since 2015, 2016, it's been screaming, oh, it's the highest level ever. We're going to be in a bear market. And it still is. Well, why? Because Schiller, to all his credit as a Nobel Prize winner in real estate, is not an accountant. He is not a CPA. And I looked at his team. He doesn't have any hardcore CPAs working for him who understand how bad the accounting is. And he's using as reported earnings in the E of his PE. So of course it's wrong. Of course it's bad. But this is the warning. It's everyone that's still using these numbers are going to, one, they're going to make really bad calls, not only on is the market, is the market going to be a you know, up or down over the next one, two, three, five years, but they're going to make really bad individual stock calls. So that fits. Um, the other side is Chaikin. He regularly has warnings from a timing standpoint, talking about, you know, the, the, your website uh, domain name for, uh, for Thursday night. Chaikin also has, you know, these warnings that people miss completely. And I'll say that, you know, over the years we've missed them. We've, we've leveraged our fundamentals, but there are times you said, yeah, he would have, uh, there's one that we really love, the stock front door. Fundamentally loved it. Green signals all across the board in our system. You know, every reason to like it. And Chaikin's numbers were saying, not now. Not the time, not now. Um, now, we've lost 12% on that name. We closed our position because we have very tight stops. Um, we closed our position. But we might have waited and not even opened the position had we been looking at, Chinese, at, at Chaikin's stuff. So I would argue that uh, the warning certainly fits. If people aren't using these things, they're going to make big, big mistakes, both at a macro level in where the markets are headed and um, which stocks to buy in these volatile periods, which tend to be really good, juicy opportunities, right? As they would say, you know, buy when blood is in the streets, which is literal and figurative right now, unfortunately literal because of what's going on in Eastern Europe. But uh, it is the case. These volatile markets are times. If the fundamentals are there, which are there, if economic earnings is so strong, if corporate credit is strong, um, one, that's very bullish for the markets. And two, it means there's a lot of individual names that this is a wonderful time to be, uh, to be getting in. So, Joel, do you have any names for me or do we have to read the uh, reports? I, uh, Dan, I've been told. So, one, Chaikin and I are both giving away um, too long and too run for the hills stock ideas, meaning if you own it, get mm -hmm. out of it. And two, if you don't own it, um, we'd recommend you look at it uh, right away. And we're going to give those away on Thursday, okay. Thursday night. Uh, and so if, if anyone's listening to this podcast post Thursday, September 22, I'm sure the recording is up there and available that you'll be able to get it. So you'll hear those ideas. But yeah, I've been our teams keep reminding me not to give away our best stuff for free. Right. So I'm I'm supposed to I'm supposed to keep my mouth. I'm dying to talk about our best right. ideas, but but I'm told to keep my mouth quiet 
Uh, and so I'm happy to give you our macro calls all day long, uh, but I'm supposed to, you know, if we only have 10 great stock ideas, they don't want me giving four of them right. away uh, on every call I do. All right. So, so anyway. but no, Sorry. it's okay. But just to be clear, <laughs> if the listeners go to September 22 warning.com, sign up, tune in on the 22nd, they're going to get some ideas from both of you guys. Just to be clear. Yeah, you'll get an understanding of, of the track record. You'll see what's worked. And then we actually mentioned a couple ideas that we both love that evening and a couple ideas that are very popular stocks that we're saying stay away, okay. stay away. And these are actually some big large cap ideas that we're looking at. Um, but obviously, the stock ideas that in the product are going to be you know, our best, best mm -hmm. ideas. And so for those that want to dip their toe into our newsletter and this joint venture that uh, Chicken and, and we have together. This would be the, the time to do it if you've been sitting on the sidelines for either of our products. Yeah, I, well, I, I know I'm curious. Like, I'm going to be there on, on the 22nd listening in. I'll be out there because I'm just as interested as anybody else, more so since I've talked with you both at length here. But but you said you sounded like you um, you had more to say about the macro a moment ago. Yeah. I, I, look, we're not screaming buy the stock market right mm -hmm. now sure. in the U.S. We are saying run for the hills from China and many, many other markets. And from a pure stock picking standpoint, look, Dan, if I thought China was going to become if Pax China was coming anytime in the next 20 years, me, my kids, my, my boys... I would be teaching Mandarin all day long. <laughs> I would be. But it, it, I'd be the first. I'd say, look, I'm, I'm going to go where, where the money is and where it makes sense. But I don't have a single data signal that says that's the case. Every signal keeps saying double down on English, <laughs> double down on the U.S. stock market. Um, just you know, take your time. So a volatile period like this, I love individual stocks particularly if they flag both for our fundamentals and, and the, quote, perfect stock idea with, with Chicken's timing. Um, but from a macro standpoint, we would be buying into the U.S. stock market, but we would be dollar cost averaging over several quarters. Right. We might get another purely headline-driven, um, emotional-driven correction sometime in the next two to three plus quarters, and we'd want some dry powder to be able to buy in. So we're saying if you had... Uh, $12,000 that you're not going to be spending for the next 10 years, it should be in the U.S. stock market. It should be, period, right? It should be. And the parking spot is buying the S&P 500. But we wouldn't put that 12 grand in today. We'd put $1,000 in this month, 1000 next month. We spread it over 12 to 18 mm -hmm. months because we might get a buying opportunity six months from now where, Dan, I would love to be on your show and pound the table and say, now's the time. It's just like March, April, May of 2020. Um, when we made that big, big right. call. Yeah, that's our macro view from that standpoint for U.S. market well, in look, general. Look, Joel, I mean, you have my email. If that moment arrives, you just, you, you let us know. <laughs> All right. I'd be happy yeah. to, Dan. I'd be happy to. All I right, Joel, it. it is time for my final question. And uh, by the yes. way, it's been a great pleasure. And it's the same question for everybody, for every guest, no matter what the topic, even if it's like a non-financial topic, which we do every now and then, exact same final question. So if you could leave our listener yes, with sir. a single thought today, what would it be? Uh, this, because this is, you know, I, I tell this to my students. Uh, Dan, you mentioned, you know, that I teach a lot. I tell this to my students um, and I remind my biggest clients and I remind uh, people and, and I'm quoting Buffett, which is don't bet against America. Mm. And I'm talking about the next several decades, right? What people don't realize is what we're seeing right now. Uh, and when I say don't bet against America, I'm saying from a you know, where should you work standpoint? Um, where should you rely on, you know, what ecosystem should you rely on? The U.S. centric ones are going to do very, very well. What, what's happening in Russia right now and in Eastern Europe, you know, there are people calling for an end of globalization. It's the end of globalization. It, that it just isn't true. Um, it, it's such an overcharacterization. And, it, and frankly, it's inaccurate. What we're seeing is a re-globalization of the world that is a non-Russia less China. That doesn't mean no China. I mean, China is still exporting like crazy. Companies are still doing business with China. And that's not going to stop anytime soon. But it's a re-globalization around US-centric banking, US dollar, US capital markets, um, US, I'll say the SWIFT system. But it's not just the SWIFT system. It's the entire US uh, um, financial services system, as well as just U.S. companies and multinationals in general, right? Right now, U.S. 
the market cap of United States companies, I say right now, but it's you got to pick your measurement date, this year and for the last couple of years, um, the market cap of U.S. public-listed companies, when you look at a big database of 32,000 companies, is bigger than the rest of the world combined. So what you're looking at is the majority of the world's equity capital is U.S. And then when you think about innovation, the United States, for the last 40 years, has been spending more in venture capital every year than the rest of the world combined, and in some years, by double the rest of the world combined. Angel investing in the United States exceeds all of the rest of the world combined. Mm. Um, corporate America spends more in R&D. And by the way, most companies that spend in R&D are companies that were formerly VC-backed companies by like 80% or more. So in corporate America, more R&D innovation comes from former entrepreneurs. And so when you have this innovation dynamo that the U.S. enjoys, right, that exceeds the whole planet combined, this idea that Buffett says don't bet against America is unbelievably backed up by our database, our signals, and our research, and some very common things like market cap, but things like economic earnings that you just don't see. So whatever you're thinking for your business, whatever you're thinking for the future, whatever you're thinking about if you want to teach your kids a, a new language or whatever else, I'm not saying it wouldn't be fun to learn some other languages, <laughs> but make sure they learn English at a really, really strong yeah. level because you're looking at the super dominant position of Pax Americana for the next several decades, for the next several decades. Believe it or not, Joel, I, I hope you're right. <laughs> and it sounds like, you know, you could even be slightly off or half off or something. And I think the point would still be valid. So that's that's probably a message that we should hear about 10 times more often than we do. <laughs> So thank you for that. Well, you can subscribe to my daily because I repeat it like three times there a week, Dan. <laughs> in different ways, in different ways. Right. But uh, Dan, anyway, thanks so much. I love being on your show. Uh, it's I think it's great what you do. And you really do bring on a lot of great different opinions and voices. And uh, and so to that end, uh, thanks for having mine, uh, given that I'm sure I'm, I'm somewhere on one end or the other of a spectrum of where your listeners are. But uh, hopefully that, that gets them to think. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, man. You bet. And thank you for being here. It's been great. And we will definitely, believe me, if we, you send me that email and tell me the buy opportunities and you'll be on right quick again. So keep your mind. <laughs> or, or if we see the reverse, it, yeah. right? Um, 2008 was a tough year to tell everybody it's going to get worse. It's not going to get better. And people thought, oh, the market's down 12%. So I, if we, if our signals turn the other direction, I am not an Uber bear. I go where the signals right. tell us. I'd rather say we don't have opinions. We just have signals. Sounds good. Look. Thank right. you, sir. Thank you, Dan. Wow, that was great. And I hope that, I hope you really enjoyed the perspective of somebody who, you know, frankly, like we said, completely disagrees with me on the, the nearer term outlook. That is really necessary. I can't stress it enough. If you're as bearish as Dan, you the person you absolutely want to hear from is Joel Littman, right? You don't want to hear another bearish person because that just confirms the viewpoint. And neither Joel and I know what the market is going to be like in 10 years, right? It's just, you, you don't know. So you need to entertain different viewpoints and you need to acknowledge the fact that you don't know the future. I may think it's likely that we'll have a big bear market and you know it'll be really difficult for the next few or several years but I don't know. So I absolutely owe it to myself to listen to, you know, the Pax Americana guy, Joel Littman. And, and of course, you know, he's a great guy, obviously. He's been around the block a few times, huh? And he, he gets into a lot of powerful places and talks to a lot of powerful people. And, and he just knows a lot. And he's been working on this data set, uh, as you heard, for years and years. I think it's awesome. I'm so glad that we, you got to hear from him today. All right, let's do the mailbag. Let's do it right now. One of the most successful entrepreneurs in America over the past 50 years is going public with his fourth and final prediction about a scenario he calls America's nightmare winter. Woo. -hoo. You've probably never heard of Bill Bonner, but in addition to owning an interest in businesses all over the globe, he also owns more than 100,000 acres with massive properties in South America, Central America, and the U.S., plus three large properties in Europe. 
And I've been to one of them. It's gorgeous, gorgeous chateau. And I've known Bill for many, many years. He hired me into this business. And he says, we're about to enter a very strange period in America, which could result in the most difficult times we've seen in many, many years. And he's made three similar predictions in his 50 plus year career. And each time it proved to be exactly right. Although he was mocked each and every time. And I remember all of them. This is why I strongly encourage you to read about Bonner's fourth and final prediction, totally free today. It's all spelled out in a free report that we put together called America's Nightmare Winter. Get the facts yourself. Go to www.nightmarewinterscenario.com to get your free copy of this report. Even if he's only partially right, it'll dramatically affect you and your money. So again, go to www.nightmarewinterscenario for this free report. In the mailbag each week, you and I have an honest conversation about investing or whatever is on your mind. Send questions, comments, and politely worded criticisms to feedback at investorhour.com. I read as many emails as time allows, and I respond to as many as possible. You can also call our listener feedback line, 800-381-2357. Tell us what's on your mind and hear your voice on the show. My, for my first question, I'm going to not answer it. Elsa G., you have a question about options. I haven't tracked down the answer. I don't know it, and I'm going to find out, and we're going to talk about it next week. It's a great question. I'm not going to even going to say what it is, all right? You got to tune in next week. Really, first up this week is Don, and Don says, Hi, Dan. Love the show. On a recent episode with Austin Root, you talked about the importance of aligning your investments with your goals. I think it would be great to dig in a little bit on how to set your goals. I'm 51 and have always been a saver, but I can't really say that I have a goal in mind as it pertains to my portfolio and investments. How should someone think about this? I feel like this could be a really good topic to discuss. Thanks for considering. Best, Don. Great question, Don. Of course, this is your plan, so you know I can only go so far, but I think it starts with time horizon. So, you know, are you investing for the, for 10 years from now or for 20 or 30 or whatever it is? Because if you were investing, you know, if you were 71 or 61 or something, that would be different than if you're 51. You know, say, say you have, you know, 40 years to live. That's a, that's going to be a different type of a plan than if you're, you know, 87 or something. So, so there's time horizon. The next thing is risk tolerance, your level of risk tolerance, which, you know, again, like, I don't know your genetics, right? So I don't know, you know, I don't know how long your parents lived. I don't know what kind of health you're in. So only you can really know about your longevity and only you can know about your risk tolerance too. So that's, uh, that's the second thing to think about. And I think actually, I'm going to leave you with those two. Just start there and that will help you establish the goal. And the goal will be, you know, like something like, well, with X percent of my assets, it could be a hundred percent. I want to pursue the goal of wealth preservation. Then you'll do one thing with those assets. And then you'll say, well, I'm 51, you know, I've, I've got some working years left. I can afford to take some risks. So, you know, maybe I want to take a flyer with three or 5% of my assets or something. So, you know, then that's your speculative portfolio, maybe. It's going to be something like that. You know, I would I would advise thinking in those terms. Wealth preservation, capital appreciation, income, speculation. Your goal ultimately is going to look like that. And so as you can see like that's not really the goal, is it? That's like the means to get to the goal. The goal is something you know about yourself. You know, in 20 years, I don't want to look back and say I risked too much or something like, you know, it's, it's where the goal is exactly what it sounds like. It's where you want to be in the future. But to me, the real goal is how you want to get there. And it's carving your portfolio up in those categories of wealth preservation, capital appreciation, income, and speculation. Great question. Anthony H is next. Good to hear from you again, Anthony. 
And he says, Dan, please give an update as to the status of gold. It seems the worse the inflation, the harder gold gets hit. Do you believe this has already been priced into the market? Because it seems that the market has underestimated the transitory inflation. Do you anticipate an inflection? I worry things will not go well if people acknowledge the fact what is going on and go into gold. As a gold investor, I kind of hope it happens, but I picture chaos. What do you think would happen if people lose faith in the US dollar, Anthony H.? Well, yeah, if people lose all faith in the U.S. dollar rapidly, you you definitely want to own some gold. So, and I would say you want to own some gold anyway. And yeah, I hear you about the the near-term price action. You know, Joel mentioned it in the interview. I got nothing, right? Ultimately, all I'm ever going to respond to with that criticism of gold is it's beaten stocks in the 21st century and it's done great since, you know, it's a 50 bagger since 1971, since Nixon cut the cord between gold and the dollar. So, and it's been around for 5,000 years. I mean, the odds that this is the inflection point when gold stops doing what it's done for 5,000 years, I think are fairly poor. So I think you should own it for those reasons. And in the meantime, can I explain the market action? Eh, not, Not really, except that, you know, if you look at past equity bear markets, gold does tend to sell off at some point because at some point people get so scared, they just want to raise cash anywhere they can. So, you know, even though gold may wind up higher at the end of a bear market than it started at the beginning of the equity bear market, you know, in between it'll be volatile. So that's why I tend, you know, I can't, I'm not saying I can explain it, but I tend not to worry about it. I hope that covers it for you, Anthony. I know it's very unsatisfying. You know, nobody knows what's happening with gold, right? All right. Lastly, uh, this week is Taylor S. Taylor, thank you so much. I love this question. Hey, Mr. Ferris, since the U.S. dollar is the world's reserve currency, wouldn't one of the first signs of global financial collapse be the failing of international currencies before the fall of the U.S. dollar? You mentioned the DXY, the dollar index, being 110. Isn't that a sign that people globally are getting out of their currency and into the U.S. dollar as the final lifeboat? Thoughts? Thanks, Taylor S. Yeah, Taylor, I want you to Google something. Google dollar milkshake theory. And we're tr- I'm trying to get the guy who, who um, authored this theory, his name is Brent Johnson, onto the show. This is a fascinating topic. I think it's an extremely important topic. And the dollar milkshake is exactly what you describe. It's, you know, the other currencies all weaken before the dollar. You know, the dollar is weak, but everything else is weaker. You know, and you and the dollar is weak in terms of everything we buy. It may not be weak in terms of, you know, the stock market or even gold and silver, which, you know, the prices are down, so the dollar is stronger against them, right? But it is certainly weaker against every necessary of life. It's weaker against rent, food, energy, everything you can name that you need to live your life. So that's a genuine weakness. But versus the reason that, you know, the the dollar appears so strong is because the other ones are so weak. Look at the big components of the DXY, you know, like the euro and the yen. Get a chart of those next to, you know, next to the DXY, it's like they're, they've been brutalized. So they look, you know, it's not that the dollar looks so great. It's that it, it's not nearly as bad as the others. And you're absolutely right. The reason it's called dollar milkshake theory, it's named after that scene near the end of um, uh, There Will Be Blood, which is a a film with Daniel Day-Lewis based on a book called Oil, published in 1927 by Upton Sinclair. And and it's this character, Daniel Plainview, is this avariciously greedy oil man, you know? And he's telling this guy who had land next to him, the guy thought he was going to make a fortune because his land had oil too. And he, you know, he thought he was going to eat. I forget what he what he thought in the movie. I think he thought he was going to sell the land to Plainview or you know to Daniel Day Lewis's character, or maybe just give him a license to produce oil or something like that. But then, then Plainview gets this guy alone, and he says, he says, he's talking about the guy's 
oil on his land and he says, you have a milkshake and I have a straw and my straw reaches all the way across the room and I drink your milkshake. And then he goes, it makes this slurping sound. It's a fantastic scene. And he stands in front of the guy and he keeps poking him in the shoulder and telling him that he's screwed and that he's an idiot. And that he's, you know, he just keeps making fun of him and insulting him. And it's brutal, but it's a fantastic scene. And of course, Daniel Day-Lewis is great. And the guy who plays the other guy, I forget his name, he's great too. That's the milkshake. So the dollar is kind of the sucking thing that sucks the liquidity out of other economies and then, you know, eventually implodes. And dollar milkshake theory says the Dow and the dollar and gold will all go up as these, you know, other economies are hit in the manner you suggest, Taylor. And ultimately, gold will be the last man standing in all of this. You know, we're obviously not there yet, but we are into the, you know, stronger relative U.S. dollar phase of this for sure. And I'm, I'm curious to see how it all plays out. And your question is most welcome, and I love it. It's something everyone should be asking. All right, well, that's another mailbag, and that's another episode of the Stansberry Investor Hour. Hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. We provide a transcript for every episode. Just go to www.investorhour.com, click on the episode you want, scroll all the way down, click on the word transcript, and enjoy. If you like this episode and know anybody who might like it, tell them to check it out on their podcast app or at InvestorHour.com. And do me a favor, subscribe to the show on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And while you're there, help us grow with a rate and a review. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Our handle is at InvestorHour. On Twitter, our handle is at Investor underscore Hour. Have a guest you want me to interview? Drop me a note, feedback at investorhour.com or call our listener feedback line 800 381 2357. Tell us what's on your mind and hear your voice on the show. Till next week, I'm Dan Ferris. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Stansberry Investor Hour. To access today's notes and receive notice of upcoming episodes, go to investorhour.com and enter your email. Have a question for Dan? Send him an email feedback at investorhour.com. This broadcast is for entertainment purposes only and should not be considered personalized investment advice. Trading stocks and all other financial instruments involves risk. You should not make any investment decision based solely on what you hear. Stansberry Investor Hour is produced by Stansberry Research and is copyrighted by the Stansberry Radio Network. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansberry Research, its parent company, or affiliates. You should not treat any opinion expressed on this program as a specific inducement to make a particular investment or follow a particular strategy, but only as an expression of opinion. Neither Stansbury Research nor its parent company or affiliates warrant the completeness or accuracy of the information expressed on this program, and it should not be relied upon as such. Stansbury Research, its affiliates and subsidiaries are not under any obligation to update or correct any information provided on the program. The statements and opinions expressed on this program are subject to change without notice. No part of the contributor's compensation from Stansbury Research is related to the specific opinions they express. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Stansbury Research does not guarantee any specific outcome or profit. You should be aware of the real risk of loss in following any strategy or investment discussed on this program. Strategies or investments discussed may fluctuate in price or value. Investors may get back less than invested. Investments or strategies mentioned on this program may not be suitable for you. This material does not take into account your particular investment objectives, financial situation, or needs, and is not intended as a recommendation that is appropriate for you. You must make an independent decision regarding investments or strategies mentioned on this program. Before acting on information on the program, you should consider whether it is suitable for your particular circumstances and strongly consider seeking advice from your own financial or investment advisor.